The sacred divine feminine is creative, abundant, flowing, receiving, and disruptive. And the new energy of money, including cryptocurrency, decentralized finance, NFTs, and even the metaverse, is all these things too. Welcome to The Goddess of Crypto, a weekly show where women who are already in this powerful space will cover these topics simply, so you can relax into knowing that the future of finance is female. Hello and welcome to another episode of Goddess of Crypto. I am thrilled to have with me today a singer, songwriter, and music pioneer, Tatiana Moroz. Tatiana has been doing incredible things, and she's been doing them first. And we're going to talk to her about that today and what it's like to be a woman and an artist in the age of blockchain. Tatiana, hi! Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk to this all-lady audience. Well, I'm sure there's some guys trying to listen in, but this is for us, by us, if you will. (laughs) That is correct. You are absolutely right. So I want to talk to you about your journey uh, through being a singer-songwriter into the crypto and blockchain space. Uh, Talk a little bit about your coin and and what caused you to do what you're doing with your work. Sure. Um, So I got involved in Bitcoin in 2012. I had been doing some like political activism and I learned about the Federal Reserve. So uh, I got in at $11, but sadly, as a musician, you know, you don't have that much to invest. Uh, but I really saw the potential very early on. And I was very lucky to just become friends with a lot of interesting people, a lot of great characters. In 2014, you know, I had been hearing about, you know, Bitcoin 2.0. And I was talking with my friend Adam B. Levine from Let's Talk Bitcoin, which was a very popular podcast back in the day. And he and I worked on a project called Tatiana Coin, which was the world's first artist cryptocurrency. So it was built on top of Bitcoin using the counterparty protocol. This predates uh, Ethereum. And so this was back in June of 2014. And so that was really kind of a little bit different at the time. People didn't really know what to make of it. So I used Tatiana Coin to fund uh, my third album called Keep the Faith. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. So I want to um, I want to talk about something you just said about the Federal Reserve. You found out about the Federal Reserve, and that's what caused you to get into buying Bitcoin. But what was it about the Federal Reserve? What happened? Well, when I was growing up, my mom used to play a lot of music from the 60s and the 70s. And one of my favorite artists was Cat Stevens. And I loved how he could use music to convey a message. And especially around peace, it was very frustrating to me as a person, right? Seeing all these wars being waged in my name and not having any ability to have any impact. And I spent quite a lot of time studying, reading, um, doing just a lot of different research. And I eventually came upon the Federal Reserve. I saw a movie called uh, The Money Masters and also America, Freedom to Fascism, a film called Fiat Empire. And all three of those films kind of gave me a really good overview of the financial system. And that's actually how I got involved politically, which now I just feel like politics is not really very effective. But, um, you know, I, I was joining the Ron Paul campaign. I was singing around the country for audiences of both the left and the right. But the reality was, is that if we don't have any control over the money, we can vote all we want, but it really has no actual impact. And People don't understand the effect of the Federal Reserve on their pocketbooks. Like they're like, oh, it's federal. And, you know, they have reserves. Well, neither of those things are true. <laughs> That's In what fact, I always tell everybody. Yes. The Federal I, Reserve is neither federal nor a reserve. In other words, it's not owned by the government and it, it does not hold anything in reserve. It is a collection of 12 banks and they basically get to set policy for everything as far as, you know, our interest rates and as far as uh, what the rules are. And it's the most loosey goosey thing you can imagine as far as being able to run uh, like what is considered the greatest country in the world from the money perspective. It's, it's kind of terrifying when the minute you dive down into it and I've not watched any of the movies that Tatiana has just mentioned. I'm going to now sit down and watch all three of them. 
But um, I still, everything I've learned in my own research has has mirrored exactly what, what you're just saying right now. So that's for our audience. If you're not familiar with this, um, please go back and watch the other episodes of Goddess of Crypto where we do talk about it. And then also be aware that um, we're really kind of being taken for a ride here. So I love what you said about uh, the, you know, the fact that politics, like your vote isn't really counting if you don't control the money. That's, that's so true. And I think that women can see that in the sense of like our own financial um, circumstances. A lot of women allow men to control them. And what are they controlling is the money. The men are controlling the women through their money, through their lack of money. And so it's it's really very very similar. Um, the people, uh, men and women, are being controlled by not having access to the money, by not having access to their ability to have a lot of it or to spend a lot of it in the way that they would like, because it's constantly being you know tightened and loosened according to this non governmental organization called the Federal Reserve. So, all right, there's my little cul de sac. Please uh, carry on. I love what everything you're saying. Thank you. Well, I just think that the idea of what is money is something that people don't really consider. And as somebody who knew about the Federal Reserve System, making me way ahead of the game with other people in terms of thinking about that, for me, it was really hard to understand Bitcoin and why I would want it. Like the guys were like, but this is going to be great. I'm like, but why? I don't understand. Why would I want to buy alpaca socks? Like, who cares? And as time went on and I learned a little bit more, I was really convinced that this was the future. This was an answer to a prayer that I had for a very long time, which is for the freedom of man. And you can't have that freedom a mankind, womankind too. Um, and so <laughs> I ended up actually, the first way that I got involved in the Bitcoin community wasn't creating Tatiana Coin. It was actually creating a song called the Bitcoin Jingle. So people want to look that up. It's kind of neat. I want to hear. I, are you kidding? I'm going to ask you to like to sing a little excerpt, if you will. That sounds amazing. I didn't know there was a Bitcoin jingle. Oh, yeah, there is. There is. Um, I should probably just play one for you. Uh, there's this guitar over there, but we could do that a little later. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm enchanted that there's a Bitcoin jingle. I'm very impressed. So thank you yeah. for being that person, too, because I know we need one. So. Thanks. Well, you know, even in the at the end of the song, there's a line. It's like, I used to cry to myself that we didn't have a chance. But Nakamoto came along with more than a song and gave the labor back to man. And that's the thing, like the fruits of our labor and everything that we've been working for is being stolen away by this system. And I just felt like it was such an incredible time and opportunity to try and meld these two things because music is the great kind of pusher, right? It, it kind of can catalyze culture. And, and that's why I think at the other hand, you know, that the music industry has become kind of co-opted and so controlled because you can't have people singing about revolution and, you know, equal rights and th all these things that happened in the sixties. Like that was kind of an interesting cultural shift. Right. And, and I think that that was because of music, because it, it's like an idea that travels really quickly. So, you know, it's been it's been quite an interesting ride. And now I've, I'm on to album four. So there's been quite, quite a bit happening in the past, I guess, decade almost now that I've been in the Bitcoin industry. Uh, so so you're thinking to yourself, uh, I'm going to make this coin and I'm going to see what happens when I make this coin. Were you involved in the in the creation of it, in the minting of it, in that process? Or were you, did you look to somebody else to help you with the technology, but you just had the idea for it? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I think a lot of women, not just women listeners of the show, but women in, in general that I talk to, there's this feeling that, well, I don't understand this thing. I can't access this thing. This thing is new, but it doesn't belong to me. And I think you're a, such a shining example of, you were the first person to do it. So, you know, and at the time, there probably weren't nearly as many YouTube videos about things like your own coin that there are right now. So how did you come up with the idea? And how did you execute that idea when it had never been done before? So basically, you know, I had been in the music industry for a while, and I was very frustrated with what I was seeing. It was very controlled. And just any artist 
couldn't come in. You had to either be signed or you had to be a drug dealer or you had to be some kind of sketchy thing, right? It wasn't always based on talent and it drove me crazy. Um, so I was, you know, singing in clubs around New York and people were like, oh, you need a niche. And, you know, I didn't really want to come up with that either. But at the time, Amanda Palmer had done one of those Indiegogo campaigns and it was wildly successful. But the problem with doing an Indiegogo campaign was that you didn't really have any kind of like longer term relationship. And then at the same time, I was really intrigued by using social media in order to get onto, you know, in touch with my fans. So it was like Friendster and MySpace and Facebook and YouTube. But what I noticed as I was going from each of these platforms was that I was losing fans. And then when I became more politically active, you know, people have been getting their accounts kind of frozen for longer than just, you know, the past couple of years. Right. So those messages were being a lot more controlled. So I figured by creating my own almost like an inverted Facebook, like literally before they called it Web3, we weren't even calling it blockchain. It was Bitcoin 2.0. And so all I wanted to do was create a network that I had kind of control over that I could have for a longer term basis. And I wanted to create a way where I can have like access to my fans also to fund my work, right? All I've done my whole life is have eight jobs. You know, I'm doing music on the side, but I have to waitress. Doing music on the side, but I'm working at the studio. Then I'm working at the studio and I'm arguing with them. Can you please give me some free studio time? No. You know, like the whole thing is just an effing hassle. And my suffering, I think, is something that a lot of other artists can really identify with. And even now, 10 years later, I still feel like we have a lot of places to go. So back then, I was just trying to solve fans and funding. And I, you know, reached out to my friend, Adam B. Levine from Let's Talk Bitcoin. He is a visionary when it comes to token stuff. I also work with my good friend, Lisa Chang, and I started vetting different projects going to MasterCoin, I went, uh, Ethereum wasn't ready yet. And then there was, I think something else, but I ended up going with Counterparty. So it was me and a few different people that were working on it. And I was not technically inclined. I was more telling them what the problem is from an artist perspective. And also, while this sounds kind of silly, I liked being the dummy in the room when it came to the tech, because you need somebody to bring everybody back to reality. I mean, I'm not a dummy in other ways. I shouldn't talk so negatively about myself, but I thought, I think it was an advantage because I hate tech. I hate computers. I don't even want to know how to turn on like a, like a robo vacuum. You know, now I know, but that, you know, this is something that's so totally unappealing, but I acutely understood the problem of the artist. And I also got the good business perspective by working on the studio side, understanding that business perspective. I think that it gave me a lot of insight. And I also had a lot of um, cool people that worked with me. So the guys, you know, helped me with the counterparty mint. I think I may have pressed the button. I don't remember. But, um, you know, it, it's been it's been quite a ride. And it was also super difficult. And I felt kind of trolled, too. Like, there's this guy. I won't say who it is. He used to throw events here in Miami. Very popular ones. And he went around this Toronto conference and just ragged on me and was acting like I was, a I was a scam project. And, you know, I had friends of mine who were pumping and dumping. Right. And, and I could have pumped and dumped, but I didn't want to do that. And so it was a a, a pump and dump in case you're not familiar with this, uh, viewers and listeners is when a coin comes out, uh, it goes up really high, really fast. And then everybody goes, Oh, I made my money. And there's a huge sell off a dump. And so the coin then drops significantly in value. And it's true that most coins that come out um, at the time of this recording, there's been a brand new one that's been immensely popular called Pepe, which is based on the little green crypto frog that's around. And um, Pepe is an example of something that was hugely popular and has experienced in its two week life two pump and dumps. And a lot of people have like one guy spent $250, bought, you know, billions of these coins, then became a millionaire on that one trade. I don't know what his other portfolio was like, but he took a flyer for $250 and then uh, made millions. I don't know if he sold it off fast enough, but that's the kind of thing that happens all the time in crypto. So there are overnight millionaire cases, but there's a bunch of pump and dump stuff. And so what's become popular is to say like, you know, that that's an example of how 
as they call them, uh, well, altcoins, but as as they are known um, non affectionately in the industry, shit coins. It's the reason that they're called that is because of those things like pump and dubs that they don't have any real value. And Tatiana, I would say that you are not an example of you know like Tatiana coin is not an example of that because there is a utility behind the coin in the first place. The coin does not There's exist. A to, no. Yeah, the, the the coin does not exist to glorify Tatiana. The coin exists to help facilitate Tatiana's music. That to me is empowerment. And whether the coin sells, you know, up or down or whatever is less important than you were able to create something because of it. You were able to empower yourself because of it. You were able to go around the system because of it. You were able to create something that was a, a, a new way to crowdfund what you wanted to do in your art. And that is true value. Like that's incredible. So I, I like, I would buy Tatiana coin just to support you. And I think maybe that's why a lot of people did it. But then of course, there's other people who are like, just, you know, where can I make my buck and I'm out. So I think that sucks that that happened. And please pick up your story right where you left off. I want to hear all about the rest of what happened after that. Oh, well, thank you. So Well, we sold it. We made, I don't know, 20 or 30 grand or something. It was enough to fund the record, which was the goal. And it was an experiment. And um, after we created it, it was like we had a car without any roads, right? And so who will build the roads? Well, we built the roads. And so Adam founded a company called Tokenly. And they've done, I mean, we've done uh, like, I don't know, 20 different, way too early for its time kind of products. And so that's been, that's been a really wild journey for me. And I still feel like there's a lot of work to do, you know, in the music industry, in terms of adoption, you know, now I have a new album called love songs for idiots. I just put it out, um, like last month. So as I was approaching putting it out, you know, obviously the market has taken a tumble, so I didn't have the same budget to promote it. And I started thinking about, you know, the motivations of what, would make an artist want to keep creating art other than narcissism. Right. And I want to make art because I have to, right. I'm like called to it, but I also now understand business to a certain extent. And so you put out a record, right. And you make it and cost you, let's say if you're doing it super duper cheap and you're at home, like five grand, but like you're doing like the most ghetto version, like a semi-normal indie record is going to cost, let's say between 20 and $30,000. Right maybe even 50, right? And then you've got to have promotion. But if you want to put out, let's say a country song, just to promote on the radio, you need about 150 grand, right? So then when you get a million plays on Spotify, do you know how much money you make out of a million plays? A thousand dollars. Yeah, I was going to say, it's like not a lot of money at all. I was going to say 50 bucks, but I know that they play notoriously really badly. It's so hard to get to a million views on anything. And especially because me, you know, I'm always running my mouth like, oh, Liberty government doesn't like that. And, you know, the government and the music industry, they like each other. There's like, you know, it's a nice relationship there. So I just find it to be like a very kind of losing proposition because now you also have the Instagram culture, right? And you have basically all these female artists that are having a competition of like, who's going to be the most slutty? And you still have some singer songwriters and stuff. And like, don't get me wrong, girls, you want to like show your boobies all day long. But when it becomes a boob competition and not a music thing, it becomes really kind of gross and depressing because boobs are always going to win. And, you know, that's like kind of the society that we're building. I saw this movie the other day that I'd seen before um, that I like to rewatch from time to time because it's become a documentary. It's called Idiocracy. Maybe you've seen it. I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah, so like I feel like we're at this kind of point, pivotal point in society where we're kind of at this race to the bottom. If you want to have a major career, you have to still have that major backing. And I'm happy to see Web3 being explored now in the music sense. And I just think it can't come soon enough because I just don't see how I, as a sensible person, can spend thirty thousand dollars to make a record and then have to spend another hundred thousand dollars to maybe have the slightest bit of impact and maybe have, cause people aren't buying records anymore. Right. Like, how are you going to make a living out of that? How can you possibly justify that in any way? And how are we going to not have a bunch of waitresses that 
don't have their music together because they have to effing wait tables all the time. You know, there's just something really tragic about it. I know like there's not being a waitress. I liked being a waitress. I'll be a waitress again if I need to be. But like there's something about unfulfilled potential that really happens in the music industry and in the art industry. And it's really heartbreaking because I had such great experiences. So many things in my memories were molded by music and a love of music and a really genuine interaction and opening those records and playing that stuff. And just, it was a different world right now. And now it's from now. And now we have this really kind of a cheap imitation of what music should be. That doesn't mean that there isn't good music, but how can you as a sensible person, like, what if I want to have a kid and like, I don't know, do something else with my life other than try and beg my way, claw my way to the top. Why? So I can have somebody tell me you're a good girl. You know, like I don't need to be told that I'm a good girl because I know that myself. Like I don't like, as you get older, you don't need the validation that you needed when you were a kid. You know, when you're a kid, you're like, Life is so rough. I need an outlet. I need to tell people why. And then as you get older, you still have that built into you that that's how you express yourself. But the validation of likes becomes more shallow. And if you don't have the validation of likes because the system is rigged against you in the first place, well, F it. Why would you even bother? So that's why these things that I've worked toward and, and I'm so happy to see more people like building toward are so critical because I just don't see how, how like a person like me will hear a person like Cat Stevens and be, have their life changed. You know what I mean? Uh, under the current circumstances, because everything is just quick and cheap and tawdry. So maybe I'm not for everybody, but by creating an ecosystem with Tatiana coin or with creating AI NFT kind of generated art, which is what I did for love songs for idiots. Like those are ways where I can find my tribe. And nobody can come between us. And I don't care if I'm Beyonce, but I would like to be able to feel comfortable paying for the basic things and having like the same luxuries that normal people get. You know, if you're a doctor, people are like, you're the best doctor. Congratulations. Well, maybe not these days. <laughs> Doctors are a little screwy too, but you know, there's all these things where you are, are called to do something in your life. And in music, it's this unfortunate situation where Nobody cares if you're good. It's not based on how talented you are. It's based on how good of a marketer you are, who you know, and you're sleeping with, right? And 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 maybe a couple like weird little things that happen along the way. But I don't think it should be that. Like, I don't think I should have to debase myself in order to fulfill my calling. And I just want to see sustainable lifestyles for all these different artists. You don't have to be the best artist. You just have to be you and then see where it goes without having to live with stress eating you up and destroying you. And I think so, that people don't talk about that part. They're like, oh, you're so famous. And you're like, yes, I know. Here's my Instagram. But like, people don't talk about that inner struggle that happens, like where your whole validation is based on a market that isn't even a real market. So you're, you were talking about your new album and you were talking about, you said you did it using AI and NFTs. And I was going to ask you because I would think that the way to go direct with your music is to create your, each song would be a different NFT and people could buy the, you know, a, 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 like obviously would have to have like different art or something because each NFT is unique. Um, and by the way, if you're not familiar with an NFT, uh, just a quick primer, non-fungible token, which has nothing to do with mushrooms, it basically means a, something that is unique. So it, each one would have a different variation on it. So it would be able to be unique. But I'm one of those people that believes that the, everything eventually will be NFTs. You'll have smart contracts for everything and that it will be a great democratizer because uh, it, it's something that, again, you can mint or create yourself. So uh, Tatiana, I'm curious um, as to what you've done with your new album that has allowed you to go direct to take out that middle person. Cause I can, you know, I can hear the pain in your, in your experience and I can hear the frustration in your experience. And I think it's important to recognize that, you know, no matter what we do for a living, we are, you know, we're up against the fact that there's a billion other people trying to do it. And as a result, you know, differentiating yourself can be very difficult. It's hard to be seen above the noise. It's hard to be heard above the noise. And there's this other little piece 
of brain science that's really annoying. And that's that the internet has caused us to have an attention span that is slightly less than a goldfish. Goldfish, 4.4 seconds, human being, 3.8 seconds. That's kind of sad. So it means by the time you get the first line of your song out, somebody has made a snap decision and has either moved on or has decided, you know, hey, let me listen to this chick for longer. So it's, it is very hard to differentiate yourself. So I want to hear about what you're doing with the new album to make sure. that case. Well, just to your point, like what I found was that I didn't, that my experience wasn't unique, right? Like I started being thinking, you know, why can't I make a better go of this than, you know, everybody has their aspirations, but I started asking other friends and, you know, my friend is Grammy and he's in LA and I asked him, you know, Hey, how much do you get paid when you do a gig? And he's like, you know, like a live gig as a musician. He's like, you know, maybe 150 bucks, 200 bucks. Like, how are you going to have a life? This guy's a Grammy. He's a prolific, incredible musician. And the problem is, is that it's just not sustainable. So what we did with this record was, um, you know, I recorded it in Brooklyn with a great band, um, Will Hensley, my amazing uh, producer and songwriting partner. I write all my own songs, but now Will comes in and he helps me shape them. And I think we've really come up with some, we're just, a, I love working with him. He's my favorite. Uh, so we did it uh, over the course of three days at a Brooklyn private studio in a brownstone. Then we started thinking about what the artwork would be like. And, you know, the album is called Love Songs for Idiots, right? And I'd been in crypto forever. And these crypto people are really emotionally kind of deficient. And I learned that I too am emotionally deficient through this kind of love that I had. Right. And I was writing this doofus, all these great songs, and he wasn't really picking up what I was putting down. And I was noticing, I was doing a lot of reading about attachment theory. And all of a sudden I was like, wow, you know, I actually have some attachment issues of my own. And so, you know, it's frustrating. You're writing these love songs. You're thinking like, oh, this guy's clearly going to go for me. And then when he doesn't, you're like, what the hell's wrong with this idiot? And I thought, I thought that that was something that was really relatable because I'm an idiot. He's an idiot. Who in love hasn't been an idiot? And it's just a really frustrating process. So it was kind of a little bit of a funny album. Like there are some kind of comedic aspects to it. And then there's a lot of vulnerability, which is another thing that I felt like was really lacking. It's like everybody's fronting and trying to pretend that they're so cool and so great and so rich and so wise. And everybody's kind of like, just not that, not that. And people are, are suppressing a lot of their feelings. And as a musician, I feel like I have to almost put my heart on the chopping block so other people can relate to it because we need that salve as human beings. We can't feel totally alone when we're suffering, right? We have to feel like that's the whole point of music, right? It's kind of like me feel like, oh, all right, maybe it's not so bad. So we started, uh, we did this photo shoot where I was kind of dressed up and doing almost like this bachelorette kind of photo shoot where you, if people look at my website, tatianamorose.com, you'll see the photos there. Um, and so then once we had those, they're a little bit tongue in cheek, kind of whatever we, Adam was developing this tool called pixel mind. And it was AI art before people were even like, people had just started playing with mid journeys. This was in 2001. And so we started generating all these art pieces from these pictures, but you know, AI art has come a long way in terms of faces. And then it was just like, kind of like smudges. And I was like, I'm hideous. And right, I, right, I right. Said, but then I started thinking of it differently. And I was like, you know, I get to be like Eve and AI I and their model for which they will create. And so it became extremely fun. And um, the way that we also, because I'm, I saw Terminator 2 when I was younger and it really freaked me out. So Absolutely. All the Terminator movies, uh, when you started thinking about AI and everybody was like, the minute it chat, chat GPT became a thing, everybody was like Skynet, Skynet. And yes, I totally get you. It's, it is, it is, and it, it is it, yeah, hopefully that will not become a documentary as well. Yeah, uh, I hope not. And so um, then I brought in, I have this amazing um, graphic designer, Nikki Tsiani. I can never pronounce her last name. But anyway, she took the AI artwork and then she melded it. So we took the photos and we took kind of different elements. And so I liked that because the problem, like this is a really practical problem. As an artist, you have a new song, right? Now you have to all of a sudden, now you have to come up with like artwork, you know, that's expensive. And so having an AI art tool is really great because it allows artists to churn out more work very quickly, but it also enhanced the ability for Nikki 
to do her visualizations for me, right? The AI did some of the work and then we can just be like, these are the ones that I like. Let's go with this direction. And so she can churn through more clients and she can create more art too. And it's like a story, like a storyboard, like you're storyboarding it and using the AI. Yeah. That makes perfect correct. sense. Yes. Yeah. And then also, you know, I liked using those natural photos. I, I really thought that that was a cool way. So we still had, you know, the band and my musical creation. We have the uh, photographer over at key Core, and then we have the AI and then we have Nikki. And so that's kind of a collaborative way to create art. And now people can, this is, you know, I haven't put out my NFTs yet because I've been reticent about where I want to mint them. But what I'm going to be doing with them is co-creating with my fans because you can, you know, put out your own artwork and I'll be doing that. But I'd also like to see what I can kind of do with matching prompts. Like, let's say I set a style and then my fans can, uh, you know, maybe they're not even my fans, maybe just random artists that are like, oh, I'll play in this weird old space. And then they can they can help co-create. And I think that that's really neat. There's been um, a friend of mine, Skrilla. He created a really cool music project where he used AI um, generated sounds. So when you would mint your NFT, it would kind of randomly generate these different sounds. No, they're not AI generated. Anyway, there's a lot of cool stuff, but I think music is a little bit more complex than just picture token. Yay. Right. Because and that's why we had to have the roads. That's why you had to build out all this infrastructure. And the infrastructure is not quite there yet, you know, because people are also like, I, I believe in, I believe in an interoperable future where you can choose your own token, where you can mint, like you don't have to be limited to the Ethereum space or whatever. No, not knocking Ethereum, but I just like interoperability. So I'm curious to see how it'll go and I'm happy to be a part of it. Yeah, my last guest talked about that exact same metaphor about building out the roads. And she was specifically talking about um, creating the infrastructure because it hasn't been made yet and that it was going to be that it's private. You know, we thought, oh, the government's going to do it, but instead it's being done privately. And I thought that was very interesting. So let's talk about a related story. Um, you showed the cover of your album, and I'm going to ask you to show it again in a second. Um, I'm going to tell a little bit of a backstory first. I uh, first came across uh, Ross Ulbricht, who was the architect of something called the Silk Road, which you may have heard of as a, um, a, a the the place where drug dealers and pedophiles met on the dark web to trade all of the most evil things in the world. That's kind of how Ross has been like um, vilified in the media over the years. And I first came across this person it, with the story of his arrest, which is in um, the book, The Bitcoin Billionaires. It's one of the stories that they tell about the, you know, the history of, of, of Bitcoin. Now, while Silk Road is a place where you were supposed to be able to buy and sell anything, it was not actually used for things like pedophilia. And it was uh, a very popular and very inventive and innovative system for exchanging goods online. And Ross was arrested and thrown into prison for multiple life sentences. He has now been in prison for like 10 years. And the reason that I even know Tatiana is that I was very fortunate to meet Ross's mother and his sister at an event in here in Miami a few weeks ago. Ross's mom, Lynn, is an absolute crusader for her son. And it is very clear that Ross has been treated in the worst possible way, treated like he, you know, was like a, a, a the creator of, of genocide. That's the way that he was sent. And I am one of those people that believes that Ross should be freed, that Ross could do a lot more good on the outside than he could on the inside. And, you know, he was like 25 when he was thrown into prison and now he's 35. I mean, it's just a, it's a very tragic loss because uh, in addition to being a completely nonviolent person, he's got an absolutely brilliant mind. 
Um, if anybody's interested in checking out the details of this, you can look it up in Bitcoin Billionaires. You can also um, look at the hashtag on Twitter, Free Ross, and there are a lot of them. Um, and you can see all of his story. So that's my backstory on Ross. And now, Tatiana, please continue the story. Sure. So I actually first heard about uh, Ross in October of 2013 in Jeffrey Tucker's event in Atlanta. And I had just gotten involved in the Bitcoin scheme, you know, and I heard all these people talking about the Silk Road. And I was left with the impression that, I don't know, it just seemed like a bad idea. Like, well, who is this guy? Um, maybe six or eight months later, I ran into Lynn at um, a couple conferences and I was doing podcasting for the Tatiana show and I started to interview her. And once I became more familiar with the case, I realized what a great injustice had happened and just how blatantly misrepresented the Silk Road case was. I mean, there was so many shenanigans the entire time. And I felt like hearing about it from his mother was really impactful as well. You know, she just has, Lynn is a very exceptional woman, but she also speaks for the mothers of so many people who have been incarcerated. You know, the drug war is a disaster and it's done very little to improve the state of drugs. It's done a lot to like destroy families. Right. And it got to a point where I actually ended up going to visit with Ross at the prison several times. Um, I was the first person from the community that was invited to do so. And, you know, I came you know, closer with him through that time. And uh, so he made me um, a picture for my birthday and he drew it in prison. So people can see that there. Um, but he drew that by hand and it was a birthday present, but I decided that I wanted to use it on my album cover because, you know, it's a case that's often misrepresented and it also underlines why we need artist coins and why we need cryptocurrency for musicians. Because if I had a major label, I wouldn't necessarily be allowed to show my support for him. And I do support him. And I also use it as a way to bring up Ross. I have a song on the record called Silk Road. And it's, you know, very, very moving. And the purpose of it being moving is because I want to make people cry and they need to feel this because what I saw by going into the prison system and deep diving and going to these different conferences around that it's very, very unjust in the justice system. And TV isn't telling you the truth. You know, I used to watch stupid sitcom TV about like law stuff, like Ally McBeal. Well, it's not like Ally McBeal. <laughs> so, um, and, and I think it's, it's a really good cause. And I've been lucky enough to travel around the world with Lynn and, you know, advocate for Ross and also highlight again, this thing that I've been so passionate about, which is using music to convey an idea to bring about social change. I'm not saying that Ross didn't do something wrong. I am not here to judge whether he deserved prison time, but I am here to say that taking somebody's entire life away, like he will never get out of prison unless he's pardoned. And uh, he's been very, very close to being pardoned multiple times. It, it's funny because I feel like it's like the movie Blacklist. I mean, the show Blacklist. It's, you know, this is of such a fine mind. It can be used much better on the outside than it can on the inside. And we don't know how to, to do that. We don't know how to give people that second chance. Uh, we have a tendency to just throw away something that we don't understand. The There's a lot of governments trying to do that with Bitcoin right now. There's a lot of governments trying to do that with crypto right now. Just like, let's turn it off and let's throw it away and let's throw away the key. And then we don't have to look at it again. And I think that that's really a ridiculous way of showing up. Um, Ross may have been ahead of his time, but he invented something very powerful. And the fact that there were so many people using uh, his technology was testament to the value of it. And, you know, maybe it was what they call black hat versus white hat, but he served 10 years in prison for that already. And those were 10 really, like really great years of what, you know, a young man's life, right? Gone. 
And is it necessary to keep him in prison for the absolute rest of his life? I don't know. I mean, I don't think so. I know a lot of people don't think so. You get into, you know, other people who have like colored outside the lines politically or colored outside the lines with their um, their words or their deeds. And, you know, Julian Assange, for example, and, you know, all of the stuff that happened with WikiLeaks. And it's, you know, we like to think that we're the land of the free and the home of the brave, but we're, you know, we're not acting like either in a lot of cases. And it, it's really heartbreaking to see that. So I personally hope that this uh, conversation will inspire you to go learn more about Ross and uh, Ross Ulbricht and to help advocate for his freedom. Um, his mother is, as Tatiana was sharing, an advocate for uh, all people who are incarcerated and whose families' lives have been ruined because of that. And um, she is tireless in these efforts. And, uh, you know, she's just one woman and she's out there every day making sure that she continues to make noise and making sure that people don't forget about her son. And then he has become a um, a real touchstone for people. Um, so when you look into his story more deeply, it makes a lot of sense that uh, that we make some changes in the way that the justice system is is just, you know, throwing away the key. So anyway, um, I wanted to make sure that we shared that story. And thank you for showing the beautiful uh, drawing of that's you um, playing your guitar and singing. Right. It was really lovely. Thank you. Yeah. The picture is actually by Judd Weiss, who's a famous libertarian photographer. He has documented a lot of different kind of moments for, for, you know, the freedom revolution. And, um, and so that's what he, he made the picture from. Oh, that's so great. Yeah. It's so like great. an trifecta, you know? Yes. Yeah. Oh my well, God. They're going to think I'm like a Illuminati person now. Cause I made this sign. <laughs> I don't, I don't even go there. So we not, won't be a problem. Uh, yes, there. triangles are just triangles sometimes, people. So at the end of every podcast, I always like to ask my guests, what is one more thing that you want the women listeners of this show to know? This is not financial advice, but just buy a little bit of Bitcoin. I think that that was the people want me to say something prolific about art or something. No, the answer to our freedom is money. <laughs> And uh, just a little tiny bit of Bitcoin purchased now in a way that you can afford. For example, like if you're going to a wedding or like a birthday party, you want to give them like 50 or 100 bucks or 500 bucks. Think about doing it a little bit in Bitcoin or all of it in Bitcoin, because that's going to have a lot bigger impact um, than anything else. So I encourage people to just pick up some Bitcoin for themselves if they can. And uh, and yeah, maybe, you know, check out my music, TatianaMoreau's.com. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. And it's, it's brilliant advice. It's advice that I give, you know, every third episode or so we come across the need to say, you know, just buy Bitcoin, just buy a little bit of Bitcoin. Remember, you can get it on, you know, Venmo, you can get it on Cash App, you can get it on PayPal. And then also remember that you need to put it into its own uh, wallet. We've talked about that in previous shows called self custody, because as they say, if you don't control your keys, you don't control your coins. Somebody can turn off PayPal someday or Cash App or whatever and keep your Bitcoin. And if you can put it onto your own wallet, then they can't. And I always like to give that advice as well, because it's not that difficult to understand how to do that. Uh, YouTube can teach you. Uh, previous episodes of this show can teach you. It's just very important that you take a little bit of control and a little bit of that taste of freedom because Bitcoin is so beautifully designed that over time, it will have immensely more value than it does now. And again, please don't take my word for anything. Don't take Tatiana's word for anything. D-Y-O-R, right? Do your own research. That's the job of us. And we have the access to that, uh, to that education. Online, we have access to that information online. Please take the little bit of time that it will take to get educated in that way. It's so important. 
So Tatiana, thank you so much. Uh, anything that Tatiana mentioned, um, the books, uh, her music, her website, all of that is going to be available in the show notes. So please check that out so that you can get more familiar with what she's doing and uh, learn about, uh, perhaps you can learn the lyrics to a love song that you can sing to your own idiot. That sounds great. Uh, Tatiana, thank you so much for being here today. I'm so grateful that you came on the show. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. See you, everybody. If you have enjoyed this episode of Goddess of Crypto, please like it, comment on it, review it, and share it. Share it with all of the women in your life, your mothers, your girlfriends, your besties, your wives. And if you're a man, please share it with a woman because we know that the future of finance is female. I will see you next time. Every week, transformational wealth coach Hallie Evelyn leads a conversation that helps to ensure that women everywhere can learn to surf the coming tsunami of the new energy of money. You can find her at goddessofcrypto.me. That's goddessofcrypto.me. Be sure to subscribe to Goddess of Crypto on your favorite platform or watch the show on YouTube. And remember, wealth isn't just your privilege. It's your right.